Chapter 1 The Green Pea The only people I've met who knew as kids they'd be selling cars was the bratty entitled offspring of the owners. The rest of us fools who choose this as a profession suffer through this bipolar narcissistic industry which on any given Saturday could rival your favorite episode of the power, 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 power. The art of manipulation is in full display every second of the day to a trained eye. Who's feeding who deals, who's screwing who, and who's trying to get who fired is the basic playbook most run. The rest, part of a sophisticated clandestine operation of theft, money, and control. control, 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 control. That's the room you want to be in. That's where the real money is made. And I'm one of the best to ever do it. My name is Truon Bay. And this is my store, 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 store. Hey, yo, I got next. <laughs> You do better work here. Nah, I look oh well. I mean, anyway, I ain't bartend for years. I decided to take a long vacation, had a minute to think about my life, and decided to get back to what I do best, you know what I mean? But if you good at what you do, then you do that. Okay. And I'm one of the best to do it. <laughs> well, usually bartenders got a hustle. Okay, and? But you don't seem like the type of chick that come in the bars like this. So where you work at? Don't let the look fool you. I work at that shit show called Frankie's Up The Street Selling Cars. Oh, say a word. We get a few of them sales niggas in here, but never no saleswomen. Look, it's only me and one of them saggy titty bitches that work with me at Frankie's. <laughs> what made you want to get in that business, though? Oh, my God. Okay. Okay, so listen. This hating ass bitch who been trying to destroy me since high school got a job at a car dealership, and she was all over social media showing off with the selfies and shit. Then she copped a little Honda something and was fronting. Bitch, it's a Honda. How you Word. Front? So I thought it was on some bullshit and I wanted to expose her fraud ass. So I walked into Frankie's one day with my assets on full display, looking like the full figure queen that I am. Mm-hmm. And I asked for a sales manager. Well, he comes over and I said, I want to sell cars. And God damn it, here I am a month later still selling motherfucking cars. <laughs> well, damn, ma, how that's going so far? I thought all I had to do was look cute, take selfies, and they give me a car to drive while I make my bag. Right. But it hasn't been like that at all. It's crazy. Wow. I've been trying to figure out little shit like, how do I get paid? Nobody in there is trying to help me. I'm like, can you please just tell me how I'm supposed to get paid? Wait, what? Did you been working at a job and you don't know how you're getting paid? The it's fuck? bullshit. Complete bullshit. So none of them in there is putting you on? Nope. Damn, that's sick. The old guys in there is acting like bitches, and the young ones is like mad corny. I'm like, <laughs> I'm just gonna learn what I can, and then I'm about. Well, now that you mention it, you see the nigga sitting at the end of the bar? This is so cute one right there looking at the TV. What's his story? Well, I don't really know, but he knows something with cars. He cool. He come in every now and then. He have a few drinks, watch the game. He leave. His name is Truon. But how do you know he's in the car business? Well, I don't really know, but I see him talking to the sales niggas all the time. They say you know a lot, and he pull up a new whips every time he come through. Matter of fact, he the one who put me up on that drink, Sobriety's Retreat. Really? I mean, it's actually really, really good, so y'all be a fan. <laughs> Copy. You know what? I'm gonna see if he could put you up on something. 
know why. See if you can put me on the floor. Relax. <laughs> I don't know about all that, but give me a minute. All right, cool. Hello? What's up, girl? Where you at? I'm, all right. All right, I'm at the bar. I'm going to have a drink. All right, well, hurry up. All right, I'll see you Yeah, I'm going to Yo, so, listen, he said he's willing to help when he can. Here's his card. He said, call him if you need help, and he's paying for your drink. True on Bay. Yeah, that's him. Well, you know what? I should at least call over and thank him for getting me the drink right. Duh. Okay, okay. Hi, Mr. True on. Uh, thank you so much for the drink. Where are you? Wrong. You're probably from uptown somewhere, right? I mean, oh, I'm so sorry. Do you have a minute to talk? I mean, it's raining yellow hearts. So I'm pretty sure you have a moment to talk, but I know that she said that I just started selling cars and this shit is crazy, but they got me all the way twisted. They think I'm gonna just sit there and take their nonsense, but anyway, I heard that you the man, but I don't know where you were. But, but they say that you know the game. So how do you handle those cheap assholes? Because I be feeling like so in one of them. You know, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about because I be staying late negotiating and they be on some indecisive shit. And I'm like, where the hell are you doing here if you don't know if you want the damn car? You have time for that. Did you think about this before you walked through the damn door? So now you sitting at my desk telling me you still want to think about it. What the fuck? Who has time for that? Question. When you was 14, how much money did you see yourself making at 24? You. I'm talking to you. Yeah, you listening right now. How much I wait. Don't worry about her. She's going to keep on talking. Car salesmen love running their mouth. That's why I hate talking to most of them. They forget God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason. But I do want to know the answer to my question. Because see, when I was 14, I thought I'd be dead by 24. By that time, I already lost my mom to a stray bullet on Halloween while taking my kid's sister's trick-or-treating in Brooklyn. So please... Don't ever ask me why I hate holidays. And my man, Big Corey, he was 15 when playing with his mother's gun. He killed my best friend's older brother, Andrew, by accident and committed suicide right after. Man, the whole hood mourned those two deaths for years. And even today, that's still the only person I've known personally who's committed suicide. And as a child, I was very close to my godmother, Anita. She passed away during childbirth a year after getting married. I cried like a newborn baby when my mom forced me to see her dead body lying in the casket with her wedding dress on. That was the first and last time I ever viewed a corpse at a wake or a funeral. Then there's Jimmy, Mo, Big Mike, Cedric, Andy, Corey, and Dev, just to name a few more people I knew murdered before I hit high school. After that, I ain't see no future for me, so I just live to survive, get money, and down for whatever like everybody else. But please don't judge me. I need you to walk in my Ferragamo Thames for a moment. Try to see why I walk, talk, and live how I live. Why I took to the car game like a fish to water, more than dead presidents. And why even today, I watch the company I keep, even in my sleep. Because I know dreams come true, but so do nightmares. It's akin to the thin line between love and hate, and always current. Especially when the waters are still, and running deep. But don't sleep, because that's not what gets you. The thing that gets you, is your own shallow, narrow-minded stream of thoughts. You slip one second, and you can easily become the prey. You become the guppy on the plate in this pool of sharks. And that's just some food for thought while we travel memory lane streets in New York. Now, where should I start? I guess it should be my mother's uncle while watching a news story about a gang of thieves making off with hundreds of thousands of merchandise. He said he had no respect for that type of criminal. He said it didn't take a genius to pull off a robbery. Being an educated businessman, he felt drug dealing was more of an intellectual man's sport. 
some role model. But that always stuck with me because being young in Brooklyn, most of the neighborhood stars were stick of kids, killers, and boosters. And after years of pulling off capers myself, I'd say he didn't know what the hell he was talking about. To be successful at this shit, you gotta be a strategist, actor, psychologist, appraiser, master at body language and weapons, a student of people with the gift of gab and charm is soft and the hardest non-believer. Look, you have idiots in all lines of business, so we're not talking about the fools you've seen on the news robbing old ladies in the elevator or catching a working man trying to feed his family coming out the mall. I'm talking about those heists you don't hear about unless you're in the underworld and the ones that may get a small mention in the newspaper because they don't have a clue. My crew been notorious catching Mark slipping for years. We got so infamous all we had to do most of the time was say better lay down down, get get laid down down. and then we'll get on the floor and give us what we came for. The cash, jewels, or anything of value we wanted. They branded us the Better Lay Down Crew, or BLD for short. The crew was originally formed by this OG from Harlem everyone called Charlie Best and his girl Katrina. I met Cat first after moving in with my grandma when my mother died. I always saw Cat sexy behind talking shit and being the fly chick she was born to be. She had brown skin, average height with a banging body. She kept her hair straight down with a bang. I wasn't sure of her age at the time, but I figured she had to be about 10 to 15 years older than me. We always caught eye contact on the block, but never spoke. She was live too. She straight son of dude, but check a female fast that they didn't talk to her nice. I think they was really scared of Bess, but Bess, he was really scared of Cat. Not that Cat could beat him, he just needed Cat for her skills and didn't want to lose her. Cat was as smart as she was sexy. She quick on her feet and could charm anyone. She started boosting clothes for Bess as a teen and they upgraded to armed robbery fast. Cat was the brains, Bess was the muscle. People would be intimidated by a 6'3 height and muscle build with a powerful deep voice. He gained a rep as a gunman known for a shootout with cops at 17 and rumors of a body or two. One day these kids jumped me just cuz and I guess Cat was impressed that I didn't back down. I fought all them guys while getting pounded until she came over to stop it. As soon as she started barking on them, they stopped immediately. The leader knew Cat from the neighborhood. She said, why the fuck y'all jumping her? One kid said, we don't know him, he walk around here like he tough. She said, Kenny, you notice my block, right? Ain't no one in my block getting jumped unless I say they deserve it. Kenny stared at her, looking almost confused for a few moments, while his crew started walking down the block. She tilted her head slightly, looking back, as he began following the rest, mumbling but humble. Cat let a new port and said, You good, kid? I was mad, but I kept my cool. Her seeing me roughed up bothered me the most. Yo, you gotta stop walking around here all quiet eye fighting niggas. Been on the block all summer and the only person I see you talking to is that little Flip crazy ass. I knew Flip from visiting my grandma before we moved in with her. His mother and my grandma was cool. They put us in a room to play video games while they had house parties. Flip was a little crazy, liked to play with fire. I heard his mom tell my grandmother she thinks he started a fire at his school last year. He told me it wasn't him. I didn't care either way, he was funny as hell, so I liked him. But I told Cat he was my friend from back in the day. <laughs> back in the day? You like 12, little nigga, trying to sound old? <laughs> I thought to myself, 12. I don't know if y'all remember, but back in the day, you'd be almost offended, even appalled if someone thought you was younger than your age. Well, that's how I felt, especially from her. I told her I'd be 15 soon. Okay, big man, easy, killer. I hear you. Just try not getting your ass beat, though. You good on this block, but I can't help you out in these streets. I said I'm from BK. I ain't scared. <laughs> okay, BK. This Harlem, you heard? Niggas don't give a fuck where you from. I got family out in BK. What's your name anyway? Truan. 
Next time you see me, you better speak up or I'm gonna whip that ass, though. You can try me if you want, I said. And she just smiled. After that first meeting, we became crazy cool. I told her about losing my mom and how she died. She told me about losing her dad to street violence at 17 and doing an 18-month bid for a robbery. She hated being locked up, mostly because she always fantasized about having her own beauty shop and she had plans of going to school to begin her dream. That bid put all that on hold. She even surprised me talking about Bess and how he be cheating on her. Bess is from the Bronx. He moved to the east side of Harlem years ago, and that's where he met up with Katrina. See, they business partners, so she don't want to leave him just yet. They getting money together. But she did tell me if I ever love a girl, I should always be faithful and treat her good, because hurting a girl's heart is terrible. I guess at some point, Charlie must have really have hurt her. We see each other almost every day on the block, and talk sometimes for hours. She said I was really smart and mature for my age, but there was one incident that made our bond really strong. One day she pulled up in a new black on black Lexus GS with 20 inch shoes dressed in all white from her Air Forces to her white tee. Only thing not white was her gold door knocker earrings. Seemed like everyone was outside trying to get one last cookout in before fall set in. I was chilling with flipping them same dudes who jumped me a couple months ago. We became friends after that. Cat started smoking a blunt with some of her people and waved in my direction to come over to her side. I gave her the what up head nod and told Kenny I'd be right back. I even remember licking my thumb with enough saliva to rub the scuff marks off one of my kicks before crossing the street. Once I get over to her side, she asked me to take a ride with her down 45th Street to St. Nick. She wanted some fried fish from Famous. I said, let's go and hopped in a new car. I'll never forget the exhilarating feeling I had riding a shotgun in a new car for the first time in my life. I thought the interior smelled like a room full of new sneakers. Cass said, that's that new car smell. She then told me not to roll down the windows because she just got them tinted and you gotta wait a day or two for the tent to dry. Next, we head down Convent Avenue, and as soon as she turned on 145th Street, I noticed flashing lights behind us. Cat pulls over and tells me to be cool. They probably pulled her over for the tents on her window. The officer then comes over to the driver's side window asking for her license, license insurance, and registration. Cat gives the officer her license and insurance. The registration, she says, is a temporary on the window. The officer says, who's Patrice Smith? Smith? Cat said, that's my mom. She just bought this car. I thought to myself, I thought this was your car. The officer then asked Cat if she's been drinking. Have you been drinking? And that's when things escalated quickly. But then she said she also smelled marijuana, yeah, like marijuana and told us to that's get out. Car. At that point, I started getting a little nervous. I didn't understand the law, but I knew drinking and driving wasn't good. Then we found out they was watching everything before we even pulled off. That's why they pulled us over so quick. Next thing I knew, more cops came and they found a half a pound of weed in the Jimmy Jazz bag in the back. But the killer was the Glock 9 with it. Before I could even think, I said, why y'all got my bag? All the cops and cat looked at me crazy. I said, I went to school shopping, that's my bag. I don't know how all that stuff got in there. They took us in and I called my grandmother. Luckily for us, that was Charlie's bag. Cat drove him to his car before he left town, and he left that bag by accident right in the back and got under the seat somehow. None of our fingerprints was on the gun or bag, but they still charged me since I said it was mine. They let Cat go but charged her with a DUI. It was my first offense and they didn't have my prints on the gun, so they couldn't really prove nothing. Cat told Bess how I looked out for her and hit me off with a band of cash. He said, you down with us, little homie. Then he asked me if I robbed someone before. I told him back in Brooklyn, we used to rob stores by just rushing and grabbing shit. One time I grabbed his kid's pockets and ripped him down until all his money came out. I told him to run his shit, but he didn't run it fast enough, so I took it. You know, Brooklyn style. Best laughed. He said, you right, this little nigga got hard. I thought he was just a little quiet kid. 
Cass said, I keep telling you, empty cans make the most noise, boo. It's the quiet ones you gotta look out for. She smiled and gave me a wink and an air kiss without Beth seeing. Beth didn't know what I had done in Brooklyn was amateur and a surefire way to get locked up or killed. What he does with Cat is playing heist, where they control every aspect of the operation. He said he wants me to come with them on the job. They're gonna do all the work. All I need to do is be the lookout. There's a guy from VA bringing some money to buy some coke. The best other boy Stan is setting up the deal. Stan's going to be in a room with Cat making sure a dude got all the bread. Best going to come in once they give him the signal. And I'm supposed to just make sure no unexpected shit like the cops are lurking. If everything works out, they'll hit me off with a few grand. All I'm thinking is, I'm about to be 15 years old. My mom is dead. And my dad wants... My grandmother, she half a whiner who don't give a fuck. My little sister's still traumatized and don't leave the house unless she has to. I got nothing to lose and everything to gain. A new family and a way to take care of my sister. I said, Bess, I'm more than down. I'm looking forward to this shit.